Hello everyone. When the music stops like that, I'm much more used to then having to take the microphone and my soprano saxophone with my band Dancing Mice. So if you are texting or anything, uh, www.dancingmice.co.uk is what I'd rather be uh, right now. So I came and talked in July about intelligence. Uh, it's not the same talk. And that was one of my usual talks where I had, I think, about 25 minutes, and I think I had 155 slides. Tonight, I've limited myself to 10. Uh, so those are the 10 things I want to talk about tonight, 10 things about intelligence differences. Now, that's the first thing I've said here. Uh, we, we, we talk about intelligence. I'm talking about intelligence differences. I'm talking about the differences that people obtain on what are called intelligence test scores. I'm going to make no assumptions whatsoever, except for the fact that these, score, these tests exist. You can sit down, there are different types of them, and one type of test, you can sit down with a paper and pencil, and after 45 minutes you get a score. I want to tell you something about what these scores do. So those are the 10 things, let me just go through. So the, the first one I talk, want to talk about is, it's one thing, it's a few things, it's many. So there's a big argument in psychology that's as live as ever, which is, is there just one type of intelligence or are there many? And let me again explain what this means. It means, do people differ on just one thing? Are people just generally more or less intelligent? Or are there just lots and lots of cognitive skills on which we all differ and that we've all got a profile on these large number of cognitive skills? I should have asked at the beginning, I'm now remembering all my sort of intro stuff. Are there any psychologists here tonight? Okay, are there any psychology students here tonight? Okay, good, good, good. Right, so it's one thing, it's a few of things. And let me just give you a, a thing that's known about intelligence that we've known for many decades. If you take a large group of people, and if you give them a diverse set of cognitive tasks, things involving numbers, say, and words, and abstract things, and shapes. There's a curious finding that's been known since 1904, discovered by Charles Spearman, and has never been refuted, and it's this. It's that the interesting thing is, all these tasks are positively correlated, and that means people who do well on one type of cognitive task tend, the correlation that's not determined, tend to do well on all of the others. People who do well on one cognitive task tend to do well on all of the others, but the correlation is not perfect, which means that people differ on one thing, a few, and many. And here's my one slide. Right. What I've done here is just take an example of some mental tests that come together, there are 13 of them in a mental test battery known as the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. It's not a series of paper and pencil tests, it's actually tests that a psychologist would sit down and administer one-to-one -one with a person. It takes usually a couple of hours or so to do it. And if you just look, I've got a green pointer, so do by all means stand up or crane your neck if you can't see. Can you see all these little acronyms along the bottom? These are the 13 individual Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale subtests. And if you take a large number of people, by which I mean hundreds or thousands of people, and look at the associations among their scores, all of these tests correlate positively. Once again, people who tend to do well on one tend to do well on all of the others. Right, what does that mean? It means that there's probably some more general capability underlying these individual scores. That means this, that although there are 13 tests, there are probably not 13 completely separate skills on which people differ. And what happens is, if you look at the pattern of associations, I've decided tonight not to make it just a statistics exercise, if you look at the pattern of associations, you can roughly bring them together with some verbal epithets. There are four tests that look as if they're assessing verbal comprehension, four tests that are testing perceptual organisation, three tests that test this thing called working memory, and two tests that test processing speed. Now, these four things were not measured explicitly. They are thought to be the, t the skills that underlie these groups of individual test capabilities. Then, there's another curious finding. If you look at people's scores on these 
four general capabilities, they're all correlated as well. So people who tend to do well on verbal comprehension also tend to do well on perceptual organization, also tend to do well on working memory, and also tend to do well in processing speed. I emphasize these correlations or associations are not perfect, but there's a tendency. And what that means is that underlying people's capabilities of doing these four things is one thing. Probably, and it's called, this is quite, well, I find it quite funny, but you know, see. Charles Spearman, in 1904, discovered this phenomenon that there's probably some underlying general capability. And he thought intelligence was too loaded and political a word. So he devised these, this term called little g in italics. And he thought, I'll use this just to take away all the controversy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> nothing could mean a bigger failure, you know. So g explains about... I've never thought of anything five to say when that happens, right? G <laughs> explains about 40 to 50% of what makes people different. Now let me just go from the top of this hierarchy back down. So this thing here that captures the capabilities right across all these tasks explains about 40 to 50% about what makes people different. The rest of the percentage out of 100 lies here and here. So what actually is the truth about mental capabilities, such as are measured by intelligence type tests, is that it, to some extent people differ on general mental ability, to some extent people differ on these broad cognitive capabilities, sometimes called domains or factors, and to some extent people differ on very specific skills. So there's not just one thing there are not just many things to do with intelligence. This hierarchy is generally found to be the case. Now, if you look back, can you look down at the bottom here? It says about each of these ten things, I want you to be asking yourself, how good is the evidence for each of these ten points? And secondly, do ask questions. So, how good is the evidence for this? Well, in 1993, a chap called John Carroll had spent the prior two to three decades bringing together 400 plus databases that had gathered mental test scores from most of the 20th century and he had analysed all of these databases using a similar method of analysis and he found this type of hierarchy in almost every single database and again those of you that are psychologists even amongst the likes of Louis Thurstone who actually did not think there was a G factor for some of his career he actually found a G factor even in his database as well. So that was over 400 databases, and I don't know a database that doesn't find this type of hierarchy with respect to how humans differ on mental capability tasks. So that's my point one. Thank you for any questions on that. You've got a question on that. Uh, the question that I uh, put on the Facebook page for the meeting tonight is. What does our speaker think of this book here? Uh, what intelligence test missed? The psychology of rational thought. I want to know what his view of this book is. Maybe you'd like to explain the book. I see. This is not a planted question. You asked me that when I was sitting next to him there. And actually, I actually reviewed this book in The Psychologist. And uh, I, I now regret my first sentence, which was, Keith Stanovich has written a brilliant book, but it's not this one. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, what I think was his, the sub, no, bless you, the subtitle of the book is much better than the first title. It's called What Intelligence Test Miss? The Psychology of Rational Thought. And that's what it is. It's about the psychology of rational thought. It's about a lot of stupid things that intelligent people do because we're humans and we're not always rational. And basically, what he didn't mention was that a lot of the things he's measuring do actually correlate, but not all that highly, with intelligence test scores. And quite a lot of the time, it's just very highly intelligent people that are being studied anyway. And so you've got this thing whereby you can't find an association between intelligence and these types of tasks if everybody in your sample is actually bright anyway. So I think it was a misnamed book. I think it's an extremely interesting book about rational thinking, but it doesn't necessarily get at what intelligence tests miss, because nobody thinks these get at everything that's important about about human thought. Well, he claims that uh, there is research to show that there's a dissociation between what he calls Mambit, mental abilities as measured by intelligence tests, and our thinking styles. 
So he says that we are cognitive misers and we don't tend to switch on our brain. But if a person is more intelligent, when they're told to switch on their rational, the rational part of their brain, then they will perform better. So what he's arguing effectively is that although you can measure such correlations, they don't really go along with the way people live in reality. I mean, what do you think about that as an argument? You're the expert, so I'd love to know your opinion. I think he's not talking necessarily about the same thing. When you mentioned cognitive styles, to some extent those impinge upon things like personality traits as well, which are not typically seen as, as abilities, if you see or normal styles of thinking. These are measuring how well you can think at your best, and we're not always doing that. And, and it doesn't capture our styles. I would absolutely say that that's true. Yeah, but what, so what he's saying is that we don't really engage our brain. So, as I said to you earlier on, I tested my IQ when I was uh, you know, young. I had the IQ of an idiot, managed to improve it to IQ of average, which was great. And then I looked at his uh, couple of little puzzles that are rational. So I've also failed the rational test as well as the IQ test. And so I, I just come to the view that these tests, they test something and I don't have it. Or I'm still a university lecturer despite the fact I don't have it. So I'm very curious about what you've got to say. Well, I already gave you an answer saying earlier that I never trust anybody who tells me we've got a low IQ. Well, and, I just did the uh, test. I didn't, I didn't devise the test. So no, I know. I think, as I told you earlier. Like Churchill as well is supposed to have a low IQ. Yeah. Any other questions about the, the first point? This is about one, like, one general ability or, or many different abilities. Yeah? Just, uh, just wondering about the Howard Gardner. Oh, right. Yeah. The idea of having. <laughs> Yeah. Or yeah. Math. That Sorry. Right. Right. <laughs> Howard Gardner uh, thinks there are nine and a half different uh, types of intelligence, if I remember correctly, that the, the, the half one at the end doesn't quite work out. He thinks there are things like uh, numerical intelligence, verbal intelligence, spatial intelligence, musical intelligence, kinesthetic intelligence, naturalistic intelligence, and something else that I haven't, I haven't remembered. The, the, the fact about the thing is, and, and Howard says this in a couple of these books, and again I've reviewed his books as well, is that if you look at the verbal and the mathematical and the musical intelligence, there's another one as well, they all correlate quite highly, as Tony Vernon's recently shown empirically, with standard IQ type tests. Other things like kinesthetic intelligence tests, they're not typically what one would call intelligence anyway, but to be fair to Gardner, to be balanced, it's been hard and he has never devoted himself to getting psychometric tests of these. He writes quite a lot of a sort of a hinterland between academia and highly practical such that he hasn't, he hasn't done a lot of uh, empirical testing of his ideas. But to be fair, they're often badly applied as well because he went to a school once, I, I remember his telling me this, where the children were supposed to be being taught along Gardnerian lines and at one point the children were crawling on the floor and the teacher was explaining how this was teaching their kinesthetic intelligence and he said that's not kinesthetic intelligence, that's crawling on the floor. <laughs> so it's quite a hard thing to put uh, But Gardner's, uh, there are parts of it that are just associated with cognitive ability and it's hard to separate from them and that there are other parts that are quite ingenious. Now what Gardner did really well though was he pointed out some things that this kind of system doesn't capture all that well. So for example, instead of going to tests, he starts from a completely different area. He says, maybe we should define intelligences as follows. An intelligence might be something that you can have a specific brain damage to. So for example, an intelligence might be something that you can do really well when all your other capabilities are low. Have you heard of savants as well? So he would say, so what about savants as well? So he points out quite nice thing. So he's got a lot of, it's a very, very, very sort of banquet, eh, Howard Gardner, but empirically not that well developed, but lots of interesting ideas, and certainly very widely taken up when it comes to intelligence. If I remember what my daughters told me correctly, two of them went to teach training college, I think Gardner was the only intelligence <coughs> theorist they actually uh, heard. Uh, I, know. <laughs> I, I knew this, this would take an hour in itself, I'll take an hour. I was just going to say, uh, uh, I'm used to testing, using the weights and testing, oh, right. testing people who are usually brain damaged and it's been a long time since I've seen anyone, you know, who has that happen, who 
do that everything's correlating together because they're usually we need islands of deficits and all that kind of thing. Well, so I'm, I'm being very clear here. I'm, I'm yeah. talking about their control samples. Sure. About, and I, absolutely, we all know that different bits of the brain do different things. If you get specific damage, we know you can lose your spatial ability or you can lose your word finding ability. Absolutely. That, that doesn't contradict that. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's try another one. It matters for education. A, one of the very first things Charles Spearman showed in 1904 was that estimates of intelligence made by teachers correlated with their scores on educational uh, matters as well. And I wanted to show you, that, yeah, I'm going to use this one. I just wanted to show you that this still holds in big samples today. So, you might not know, but since the grammar schools passed away, largely speaking, and we went on to comprehensive uh, schools, you probably thought IQ testing had stopped in schools. And I work in the area as well, and I thought that until a few years ago, I discovered that in England they're giving the cognitive abilities test to hundreds of thousands of children each year. Only now it's not for selection, it's for something called added value. It's sometimes called value added, such that to see whether a school can actually improve upon its social background and get the children onto more qualifications. And the one good thing about the UK government is it's rather generous because when I asked for the data to have a look at it with some of my colleagues, they allowed me to see it anonymously and they also allowed me to have, well, let me just show you. Over here, at age 11, they gave me the cognitive ability test verbal, the cognitive ability test non-verbal, and the cognitive ability test quantitative. Now, the children who are taking these tests take nine subtests, three quantitative, three verbal, and three non-verbal, at age 11, towards the end of primary school. Then what we said was, we asked the government, and I think it was the, development, uh, the Department for Families, Education, and something that begins with S, uh, science maybe, we asked them, would they give us their GCSE results five years later? So I'm just using, as I am in each of my ten points, one empirical example. And so what have I done here? If you can just look over at age 11, or I should say, for this particular analysis, they gave me 70,000 children's data. And for this particular analysis, I picked a GCSE set that had the biggest individual number of children. That was, oh, but from memory, about between 11 and 13,000. So it's a reasonable number in terms of database. So what do we find here? What I've done is I've taken the cat verbal, non-verbal, and quantitative, and I've got this general factor, I've just called it factor one, this general factor of mental ability at age 11. Now it's not called general intelligence, it's called the cognitive abilities test, but like every other set of tests, they correlate very highly, and you can extract one of these general factors that I showed you uh, up here, and that's all that is there. And then what we said was, we looked at the scores that they got on their GCSEs, and what do you know, all these were correlated positively as well. The person who did well on physics tended to do well on Welsh. The person who did well on English tended to do well on geography as well. And we took the commonest set of six, which is English, English literature, math, science, geography and French. You can see I tried to take a, a mixture here, art, science and social science. And you can see from these loadings, those of you who are uh, psychologists, but anyway, they all correlated highly. And we extracted this thing, which is five years later, which we called factor two, which is intelligence. And we looked at the correlation between them. Those of you who don't know, correlation is to take numbers between minus one, zero, and one. And if you get a correlation of one, it's perfect. That's not that far away. It means that there's a very, very strong tendency for the children who are bright at age 11 on these cognitive ability tests to do well at age 16 on their uh, education. It is not perfect, okay? It's not a perfect correlation, but it's a high correlation. The people who did well on general mental ability did well overall in their educational scores uh, some years later. Their education is measured in different ways. It's used a lot in social science. It's sometimes measured as scores of national tests like this. It's sometimes measures, measured as the number of years of education that people get. And it's sometimes measured as the highest qualification that people have obtained. This, of course, is more detailed because it's got a score for each individual class. 
But all I wanted to say was your ability, and this is the end of primary school, which is quite a good time to take it because largely speaking there aren't many <coughs> curriculum differences by the end of primary, and so pretty much everybody's on it, even a footing as you're ever going to get, and reasonably sentient, age 11, and then they're followed up at age 16, that joke didn't really go over, right? And, uh, <laughs> and then measuring this, again, national exams that most of the country takes five years later. We've since uh, replicated much the same uh, thing in an even uh, bigger sample of, and let, let me just think, I think it's 170,000 uh, fairly recently, they're both published in the journal Intelligence. So, intelligence matters for education. The brighter you are at age 11, again, making no assumptions about what's actually led to these differences, it uh, tends to predict quite strongly educational results at national exams five years later. That's point two. Yep. The um, exam results of the 16 GCSEs are pretty objective um, as a set of data. Are the CAP tests objective or subjective, because I recall in England there's a move away from formal testing towards more subjective assessment. They're completely formal. You couldn't get more formal. They're laid out in Thank booklets. You. I know Colleen Smith, who actually is a psychometrician who devises all these tasks, and they are absolutely paper and pencil, because sometimes intelligence tests are called paper and pencil tests, but they're nothing of the kind. They quite often involve pictures or blocks or things you have to do. These are paper and pencil, formal tests. You sit down, instructions, stop. There's no room for individual, well, I suppose if you've got a nasty or a nice teacher and you feel more or less threatened by them when you're sitting, I'm not kidding. Uh, these could have effects that could bring in noise. But no, that's a good point. They're absolutely formal tests. There are no assessments by the teachers. The nice, that's the nice thing about these. These assessments are absolutely offline. They're not biased by the teachers that know the children, maybe like one child more than another. And these are national exams as well. So, yeah. What you're showing us here, uh, is a correlation between two tests. You're defining one as intelligence and one as math, but you could equally just swap them around and call intelligence the ability to do all of these. I don't think it really tells us anything. I think that's an interesting point. No, I, I buy that actually. And you'd have to then say, if that's the case, these, as far as possible, are content free. And what I mean is this, is that the actual verbal stuff you have to do here in quantitative is kept as abstract as possible so that they don't involve stuff that you know. Sorry, ah, uh, these. This is abstract. It's not about stuff that you know. These are all based on stuff that you know, and that's the difference. So if you want to call it, I would be unhappy about this, but if you want to call that fluid versus crystallized intelligence, people sometimes refer to that as fluid, it's not stuff you know. That is stuff that you know. And if we said this is a correlation between the age 11, I mean, this is five years apart. That's remarkable. A huge correlation. But if that's your basic capability for doing stuff on the spot that isn't stuff that you know and hasn't got content, and that's how much content you pick up over five years, I'm happy with that. That's why I said I made no assumptions about these things and I'm not ready to verbal effect. You had, were an excellent I see you as well. I'm a big one. Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, one of the interesting things about the Scottish. Uh, standards is a broken down scores for knowledge and understanding and for problem solving. Yeah. Um, and the problem solving might sounds to me like an intelligence test application of knowledge in a particular context. It would be interesting to see whether those have similarly set that might. Um, okay. Look that. okay. What I'm going to show as well is how these age very differently as we as we get older. These kids. I saw you. Uh... It was just when you said that. Stuff in order to kind of like work out what the exam's asking you, kind of figure it out from um, whatever, whatever level. It's How well would you do in a French exam? Yeah, I mean, French. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not meant to be cheap. I, I just mean that's true to some extent. And I, and I think I think you're absolutely right. If you take somebody who hadn't done any of these courses and you send the brighter person in and the first, I think they'd do better, but you wouldn't get on very well in Welsh, you know, you need to know some stuff, or maybe maths as well, because there's certain conventions you need to know, but I agree. What does the, does the first um, point of test assume total ignorance of, of the world they're into? It tries to make it stuff that everybody knows, that the materials, 
And then it's the it's the. I refuse to believe that it's such an abstract test possible. Sorry. Just I don't think I've said nothing to convince me. It can't be completely abstract, but you can have stuff that's novel to you that is abstract compared to stuff that you need to know. I think there's a continuum. If that's what you're arguing, I'm absolutely fine with that. Right. This is the thing I talked about to the humanists. I think some of you came along to the talks. I gave a, a, a complete, I think it's a couple of hours, on social mobility. So tonight I'm just going to give you the two-minute version of that as well. Uh, people study social mobility because it's thought to be important. The Labour government produced a, a paper on social mobility. When the coalition came in, one of the first things George Osborne did was release a paper on social mobility. Everybody seems to think it's important. And I've, uh, with my colleagues, done some analyses on social mobility as well. And what people tend to do, I should say, who does this? Psychologists study it. Sociologists study it. Geographers study it. Economists study it. And we all study it in slightly different ways, but mostly fairly techie ways as well. And here's just a little uh, analysis that I did on a sample from Scotland on whom there were data as follows, but I'm only using this again as one example of lots of other uh, examples. This was from the Scottish Mental Survey of 1932, and uh, again, if, I'm sure you've heard, some of you have heard me talk about this before, but very, very quickly. Scotland is the only country that ever tested its entire nation's intelligence, and it did it twice. So everybody born in 1921 and everybody born in 1936 had their IQ tested with the same test on the same day using the same instructions. So 1st of, 1st of June 1932 tested 87,498 people born in 1921 and 4th of June, the Wednesday, 4th of June 1947 tested 70,805 people born in 1936. So Scotland's got these amazing databases and I've been spending the last 12 years following them up and one of the things we did was we managed to link the Scottish Mental Survey of 1932 data through to what's called the Midspan study here in Glasgow. They had data at midlife. And so these are data rather remarkably going from age 11 through to, the, through to people's 50s across a 40 year period. So we knew people's age 11 IQ from the Scottish Mental Survey. We knew their father's social class. We knew their educational attainment. We knew the social class of their first job, and again, in my lecture on social mobility, I spent about 15 minutes just talking about how you classify jobs. It's highly uh, technical and contentious in itself. And we had their class at midlife based on their housing situation, their job, and their ownership or not of a car, which was more discriminatory in the 1970s than it is nowadays. And basically, I want to point out that this is something called the structural equation model. I'm not going to try and explain it. But if you look at people's social position at midlife, there are three contributors. Where they, the first job that they got contributes, their education contributes. And even though you've got these two things in the model, sorry, there are four things, and father's class contributes. Right, so let's just stop there. So if I'm looking at my own social class, as again I talked about in my, in my social mobility, my dad was a labourer and his brothers were, were miners. And so if I look at my father's class, to my class at midlife, there's a big jump here. But if I ask myself in the population what are the determinants of this class at midlife, it's partly where you started out in your uh, career, it's partly your father's class, so there is social inertia to some extent as well. It is the education that you get, but above, sorry, beyond all of these three things is people's age 11 mental ability test score on the Murray House test number 12 that they took in June 1932 in this case. So what I'm trying to say here is intelligence plays a part along with at least three other factors in affecting where people get to in this rating of social position at midlife. And so, once again, there are four things matter. Age 11 ability, your social background itself, the class of your first job, and education. Again, I can't believe I've done that. It usually takes me an hour, so there's a lesson. Uh, and this model is not untypical of what other people find, which is, of course, why I'm showing you it. So it's neither entirely meritocratic. Do people know that phrase? The meritocracy means that where you get to in life is a combination of intelligence and effort. 
That's meritocracy. On the other hand, sociologists tend to emphasize social immobility, the fact that there's a drag, there's something about your background class that keeps you there to some extent as well. And we find that both are true in this. There is, so to some extent, an association even beyond all these things between valence class and class of midlife. Any questions on social mobility? Yeah. I mean, the idea of the valence class, you've got a bi-directional power. How does the idea of an 11 year old affect the valence class? It's deliberately bi directional. By convention, in these things, if something happens afterwards in time to something else, you put a, a unidirectional arrow indicating it might, it might be a potential cause or a partial cause. If it's bidirectional, it explicitly says you're making no assumptions about why that correlation comes about. So every big database we see, there's an association between father's social class and children's intelligence. I'm not making any assumptions, and most researchers don't either. Simple as that. Because, of course, the way the human experiment has things, you tend to be in the same house as the people that give you your genes and your environment, and so it's hard to, it's hard to separate the two. If you could make assumptions, what would you assume? <laughs> what would you think? <laughs> no, I'm asking you, you're the expert. <laughs> I think we're going to hear that again. Uh, this is a bit of both. I think that's what we find out from... Uh, if you look at the 1946 birth cohort, they've recently published a paper along these lines showing that above and beyond father's IQ, which we don't have in this, but they do, the encouragement from the parents has an effect above and beyond the parents' intelligence on the children's intelligence as well. So there are aspects of the environment that seem to help. And there's also, like having a non-threatening attitude as well, seems to help. Anything else on social uh, mobility? Yep. You've got a correlation between IQ at age 11 and class at midlife of 0.43. Yep. It looks from the diagram as though that's, as it were, composed out of com component uh, correlations. IQ to education of 0.2, followed by education to class at 0.39, followed by another one at 0.24, all of which are lower than 0.43. Right. That's good, actually. So let me explain. Yeah. Uh, Again, I know this is going to alienate some of the audience just now, but these are effectively partial beta weights in a regression equation. It's a, they're all run at once, though, right? And if you want to get the total effect of intelligence, it's not just that direct path, so you would square that to get the shared variance between adjacent variables. So the square of that, you can work out, is less than 25, it's not 0.5, it's more than 16 because it's not 0.4. And so there's that, but also, age 11 IQ is an effect via the class of first job, it also has an effect via education via class first job, it also has an effect via education to there, and you have to multiply all these paths together, add all these paths together to, to get the total it's effect. Not, it's not combining those, it's separate. No, it's separate it's, it's, these are all independent contributors. Good, good question. Okay. Any other that's quite technical question? You made a very quick comment there about a uh, non-threatening environment, yeah. I presume in terms of the domestic environment. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm aware that people are saying that I, IQ test scores are generally rising. I'm going to deal with that later. It's called it. the Flynn effect. Uh -huh. yeah. And Stephen Pinker has recently published the Better English of Our Nature, recording a decline in violence in society. Do you, yes. do you see, do you suspect that maybe... The decline in violence in society is one of these big evolutionary arguments I can't quite get my head around in terms of I wouldn't know how to marshal the evidence to, okay. to actually... Um, it's a good, it's quite daring. I mean, I, <laughs> uh, intelligence matters for survival. This is the one thing, oh God, is this true? Uh, it's sort of the one thing on the, on the list that I didn't know before 2001, when we first published an article in the British Medical Journal. Because what we did there was... Lord, it was Lawrence Wally and I, he's the first author on it. It's a paper in the British Medical Journal in 2001. And we took this Scottish Mental Survey of 1932, the people born in 1921, and we threw a cordon, my father-in-law says it's a cordon, but uh, a cordon <laughs> around Aberdeen. And about, out of the 87,498 people, about 3,000 people sat the Scottish Mental Survey test in the city of Aberdeen. And Lawrence Wally and I were deciding that we would like to call these people back to find out, given their childhood intelligence, how their intelligence had aged. 
Okay, so we're going to follow them up. And this is what happened. One day we looked at each other and said, by finding out who we can get back, we're finding out who's dead. And we thought, wouldn't that be interesting? And look and see whether intelligence at age 11 is related to how long people have lived. And so we got Lawrence Wally's daughter, Elizabeth, to go to register house. And she spent two and a bit years searching for these 3,000 people, every single one of them. And of course, you realise what happened to find out whether they were alive or dead and get their birth certificate, eh, their death certificates. Of course, you realise what happens. Men and women, women, age 11, they change their name. And so we had to send Elizabeth back and then find the marriage certificates of these women, and then go back and then find the death certificates. We managed to find 80%. You can do better now. The linkage is better. And what we reported was this, was that for the women born in 1921, an advantage of about 15 points, which those of you are statisticians of standard deviation, an advantage of 15 points in IQ at age 11 buys you over 20% less chance of being dead by age 76. If that advantage is up to 30 IQ points, you're half as likely to be dead by age 76. Now that's not the diagram. Oh, by the way, we didn't find the same for the men, because we found that during World War II, showing that this effect is not always in the same direction, men with higher ability were more likely to be slaughtered in active service and were men of lower ability, but by the time they were old, the same effect. But this is the diagram I want to show you. This is what is called a meta-analysis. It was done by Catherine Calvin, one of my PhD students, is now a research fellow on my team. And just recently, she decided that she wanted to update all the research that had been done since our paper in 2001. And she found, I think that's 18 studies, We've contributed some of these studies. She's put together all 18 studies that have studied intelligence test scores in youth and survival from all causes, all cause mortality, it's called. We've done cardiovascular, we've done cancer, we've done suicide, we've done murder, we've done lots of other specific, this is just all cause mortality. And this is the average effect that she has found. The average effect is about, in fact, it's on the slide on the computer, but it's about there, it goes through that middle one, about there. And the average effect she's found is this, is that standard deviation advantage, about 15 IQ points advantage in youth, buys you about 25% lower chance of mortality several decades later. Now, each of these dots represents a separate study, and what I also want to show you, and again it's too faint, but that number one there would be where all these dots were if there was absolutely no effect. If a higher IQ made you die sooner, all the effects would be over here. None of them are. The only one whose 95% confidence interval even overtakes the null is this tiny stent, uh, one here by Laurie Martin in the US. And that was a really weird sample that I will tell you about if you insist. But all of them go across here. Now the dots are proportional to the size of the sample. Now you must be noticing that one. That's the study we published of the Swedish conscripts where we were studying over one million men in that film because they still had conscription. And so we had a million men in Sweden who had taken mental ability test scores of conscription and were followed up to survival in national databases. Sweden is just amazing in terms of linkages of databases from army databases to social databases to education to health. And it's all done anonymously. You never get any identifiers from it. You can't work with them to identify these things. So that is a million men slap bang in the middle. And can you see all the others spread themselves around that? So intelligence in youth, sorry, an intelligence test score in youth and again, I'm, I think I know the first question that everybody's going to ask. Uh, can you ask him? Uh, it's related to survival or mortality from all causes. So that wasn't known before 2001 generally. There was one study published on Australian Vietnam veterans, and not even many people know that the Australian had <laughs> Vietnam veterans as well. But it was just men, and it was just it sort of accidents and that kind of thing, up to middle age. Ours was the first study looking from youth to, to old age. 
But any questions about the association between intelligence test scores and survival or mortality, whichever way around? Yeah, Farah? Sorry, um, just like about adjustment for socioeconomic factors, because obviously That's were, always the first one, question. Two, three, three, four, three, yeah, three, 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 three. it's always the first question. Right, Catherine's done that in this study, because quite a lot of the studies had details on those things as well. Now, I have to emphasise, social class is almost always measured by jobs, so we might or might not be happy with that, but that depends on how it's measured. Uh, this is what happens. If you adjust these, and they're almost all done, just in case people want to know, by Cox's proportional hazard regression, if you adjust for parents' social class, it does almost nothing to these. It keeps the effects all as they are. However, if you adjust for either your own social class or education, it has some attenuating effect. However, I don't think that necessarily gives you an explanation because we know that intelligence tends to get people more education, tends to, uh, just in time I mean, tends to get them into, so for example, I'm at my desk uh, rather than down the line, unlike my uh, sort of, uh, relatives, but it tends to get that. So when we first published this, we thought to ourselves, and maybe people can think of more, we thought there were at least four explanations for this, and all of them could be true or, or none of them could be. One is exactly that. It was basically a social class driven thing. More education, more social class, just a different life, that's one thing. Secondly, it could be health behaviours. It could be that higher ability people then adopt different sorts of health behaviours throughout life and then less likely to die. Another two things that could be the case, one is a high ability test score at age 11 might also be some sort of a record of things like birth trauma and infections and dunts on the head that you've had prior to that. So it could be that as well. And then fourthly, it could be that if you get a good test score, it could mean the rest of your body is quite well put together as well and you're more resistant to things. So we thought there could be at least four explanations and we've tried to chase these up as, as the decade has gone on, basically. So that's a long answer, a short question, but it's a good question. Right at the back. Hey, Cass, what, what's so weird about that one sample? Hey, just really big. I mean, the, uh, oh, sorry, the, the Laurie Martin one. It was the termites. <laughs> it was the termites. It was the, it was the people studied by Lewis Terman since the 19... Oh, were they born? 20s? They were all of an IQ over 135. <laughs> Every other sample is sort of more normal than that. But they are freaks. They've got <laughs> statistically <laughs> no 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 names go back. No. Uh, statistically they're freaks because they've all got IQs over 135. I find it rather unusual that there should be even an association among such an elite uh, group. Again, just statistically the elite group. So. Uh, yeah, they were the termites. That's what they're called. If you just type that into uh, loose terms, termites into into Google, you'll you'll see what they are. So they've been a long, long, longer. That's also the sample of termites, where it was first found. Do people know about personality traits? There's there another one in my science professional lecture. There are five broad personality traits, okay, that we differ on: extroversion, neuroticism, openness, agreeableness, and conscientiousness. And guess which one in the termites relates to how long you live? Conscientiousness, that's absolutely right. It's quite well replicated now. The childhood and young adult differences in conscientiousness tend to be related as well, in, in, independently of intelligence, to how long people live. So that's, that's why those were weird. You, you hinted that there, that's the all cause of mortality, but is, is there a specific uh, variation by disease? And yes. does that help you dissect the, the four? Yes, uh, it does actually. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I mean, I, I was saying to you earlier, I, mean, I originally trained as a doctor before I was a psychologist, and uh, it hadn't quite occurred to me that people don't die of many different things. It's actually, once you take out cardiovascular disease and cancer and external causes, there isn't all that much. So in fact, what looked like an impossibly heterogeneous job wasn't all that difficult. And so if you looked at it, it tends to be that, well, youthful cognitive ability is related to deaths from heart, cardiovascular diseases. The evidence for cancer is much more mixed. So what way is it related to cancer? Cardiovascular disease. So if you look at specific causes of death, lower ability in youth is more related to cardiovascular, oh, right, cardiovascular disease at an earlier age. It's related to external causes such as accidents, 
it's related to suicide, sadly. It's related in the Swedish sample, because the Swedish sample's a million, I think it's 185 were murdered, and that, that was related to that as well. And so I would say that not all of these would have the same explanation. Again, we've tried to, we've tried to pull that apart. But with regard to you're saying, does it help you dig into these things? Yeah. Well, the cardiovascular disease might, because there's another good sample that we've been using called the Vietnam Experience Study in the United States. And there, we published a paper which showed that their conscription mental capability was related to their death from cardiovascular disease. And about a third of that was explained by whether or not they got the metabolic syndrome by middle age. Now, the metabolic syndrome is related to health behaviour, so it helped us to death. So if people don't know what the metabolic syndrome is, you want, you can, this is something you want to avoid because it, it counts for quite a lot of things that you don't want to get in the old, like type 2 diabetes, like cardiovascular disease. Metabolic syndrome, here we go. Waste hip ratio, and you can probably guess what sort of ratio you want. You want good glucose tolerance, you want a good hemoglobin A1C or a good glucose test, you want relatively mm, average blood pressure, and you want a good lipid profile. So it's a combination of those things. Waste hip ratio, glucose tolerance, that is not being type 2 diabetes, okay? having a good hemoglobin A1C as it's called, having good blood pressure and having good lipid profile. So those are the things. And they statistically come together as this thing called the metabolic syndrome. And that's something that you do want to uh, avoid, in, especially in middle age. And so what's the relationship between the metabolic syndrome and performance? Lower ability in conscription, yeah. more likely to get. Is that a big effect? Or? It's about the same as, I'm just trying to remember our, our actual paper on it, it's about the same as the sorts of things we're talking about here. So in terms of a, a COPS regression, it's probably about 20% more we'll like to get for each standard deviation of IQ that you're lower on average. Any other questions about survival? Uh, I'll take a few from you, so I'll take this chat. Yeah. I'm not sure if this is a good question or not. So, which, I know, which causes of death uh, were the most demonstrating this effect? Oh, that's a brilliant question, I see. And it's really sad. I've got a slide which shows in graphic little uh, icons the external causes. And really sadly, the really big effects in terms of there being a strong association between mental capability and youth and dying from them are things like murder dying from in a fire, dying by accidentally taking poison, dying in a car crash and accidentally drowning. So although these are small numbers, because the Swedish data is million subjects, you've got a substantial number who died from each of these causes. So those are the sorts of things that have the biggest effect, and you might think, well, that's easy to explain. But the more interesting ones, in terms of the population significance, I suppose, are the ones that lots and lots and lots of people die of, and that's cardiovascular disease, because that's what most of us in this room are actually going to perish from. Okay? Unless, there's, unless there's a meteor hitting all the way we're mostly going to die from cardiovascular disease, then cancer. Okay, will, I, will I move on? I think we're just about dead on, actually, uh, in terms of getting through things. Oh, well, so something non controversial then. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, We've published a couple of things recently, actually, and, and I'm not going to cover them. I don't know if people have seen them, but we did something on, in Nature just a week or two ago looking at some of our Scottish mental survey samples using DNA testing instead of uh, twins, but that's not what I'm going to do tonight. I'm going to simply tell you that for most of the study on genetic environmental things, it's been studied on twins and adopted people sometimes called natural experiments and, and, and uh, social uh, experiments, experiments used in inverted commas because nobody's actually doing them as experiments. Now, when it comes to these studies, people basically, if we take twins for example, they basically take pairs of twins, and you probably all know there are monozygotic twins that come from one egg and dizygotic twins that come from two different uh, fertilised eggs, and dizygotic twins share on average, 50% of their genome, and monozygotic twins are pretty much identical in their genome. And people look at twins and how similar and dissimilar pairs of monozygotic and dizygotic twins are. Now, when it comes to studying the genetics of intelligence, they give them intelligence test scores, but then they look at the genetic contribution, but then they look at the environmental, and you've got to understand that the environment in these studies is divided into two different environmental effects. One. One environmental effect is the environmental effect you share with your rearing family. 
and it's called common environment. And the other environmental effect is called individual environment. The environment that you have, that your siblings don't share, for example, the different teachers you had, the different illnesses you had, the different things that happened to you, etc., etc. And what I want to explain now is what happens throughout life to, because there are twists. And the two twists are this, is that throughout life, if you look at groups of individuals, the genetic and environmental contributions do not stay steady. They change by age. They might even change by social class, which I'll mention in a wee while as well. Although there's one influential study, not many more. And there's another twist in, I always think it's not the environmental thing that you think is going to make a difference, it does make a difference. And here's the diagram, I've only, as I say, allowed myself one diagram for each, and that's my diagram, uninteresting as it looks. Right, for, let's see how this is doing. Right, you've got bars here, and if you go here, this is 0% and this is 100%. So we're trying to explain 100%. Remember what we're talking about here of why people differ in mental test scores. And this is age. This is age 3 and this is age 82. And this is something I put together with the Amsterdam Behaviour Genetics Group just a couple of years ago. We're trying to take the best studies we could find. Uh, these are all twin studies. And what we did was the black bars are the additive genetic effects. So if you want to start asking me about non-additive, uh, non like dominance epistasis, I'm happy to talk about that as well. But these are the genetic effects. And can you all see that in youth, the additive genetic effects only account for about a quarter of why children are differing in intelligence? Is that clear? All of what you'd say is, yes, you can see these bars are quite short. <laughs> As you get to adulthood, these black bars are much larger. And I have to say, up here there's much more wobble, because we don't have great evidence for these very old individuals. But largely speaking, during adulthood, it seems to be that additive genetic effects from these studies seem to look as if they're contributing to quite a lot of people's differences in intelligence. Now, the white bars, the white bits at the end of the bars, are the individual environment, the environment you don't share with your rearing family. And these grey bits are the most interesting. They've got an enormous effect when people are young, but you can see they burn themselves out by late adolescence. So the effect of social environment, or common environment, or rearing environment, whatever you want to call it, really does have a big effect until you get to adulthood, and it doesn't seem to be making much of a contribution by then. So, the twist is, it seems to be the individual environment that stays with you and always has an effect throughout life on people's differences in intelligence. We're not talking about how it makes up your intelligence, it's how people differ in intelligence in the community. The, the social environment or common environment has a big effect early on and burns out and the genetic effect seems to be fairly strong. So, that's just the headline. There does seem to be an effect. <coughs> One influential study by Eric Turkheimer that finds that the genetic contribution might well be much stronger in relatively privileged samples that, that form the majority of these than in much more deprived uh, backgrounds. And you want to ask a, a question on the genetics? Yep. Back. Just on the these grey bars in the middle, is it just the fact that by you know age 12, 13, 14, then? Twins are likely to be doing more, less things together, and therefore there's more differences. Yeah, that, that's a good point. But remember, if the things that had happened to them earlier on had affected them, it would stay with them and keep the differences. They, you see what I mean? Keep the similarity. So it means even if that were the case, it means that you're losing the effect you had earlier on, which is not what I would have thought was the case. I, I mean, my immediate, my original assumption would be a that the it would be the common environment that would stay with you throughout life, not necessarily the individual environment as well. So let me just emphasize the way I see your question is that it's the lasting effect that these seems to go. And I don't know why that is, why, why the effects of the individual environment <coughs> would stay and the other environment would. I just wonder that your, your individual environment becomes a greater proportion of your environment as you grow older. And therefore, your, your common commonality between. But I mean, I, I accept that, but I mean, I've 
got children, and we're all, we, we were doing everything we can because we think whatever you do when they're young has, will have a big effect later on and we'll stay with them. We don't think it's going to burn out by um, <laughs> 16. And of course, you never act that way. I mean, when you've got children, you act like that. I mean, I don't care about this, but I've got my, sort of, my children, I'm all sort of, too open. But, but you don't care about this. You actually act as a 100% environmentalist. In fact, you, you basically act as if these grey bars are 100% all the way through. And that, that's the way I think any parent actually it's acts. It's comforting to know that you're not responsible for a 16-year-old's behaviour. This is the idea. I mean, that, that's often used as a joke, that parents probably get too much of the blame, but I mean, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, because you're giving them the genes as well, aren't you? Um, Is it anything, anything to do with end of school education? How do you mean? Well, 16, let's say, age 16, you, 18. 16, that time is also the sort of, the time when it doesn't absolutely get that much higher either, so it's kind of the end of cognitive development, not the end of the world, because you're learning things after that, but in terms of the, the peak that you can achieve, you're not doing hugely better after that. Well, yeah, you've presented this with a correlation and not a mechanism. What I'm proposing here is that at the end of formal education, you see the shared environment disappear. Is it to do with education? Education almost is very strongly shared environment because that's that's, that's one thing point. you do yeah, that's you do point. to share. But you would expect, what I'm saying is the variance that it's contributing to in mental capability doesn't seem to last beyond that. So you would expect these effects of education to last and to contribute to individual differences later on in life as well. You wouldn't think these things would just end when the education stops. Mm -hmm. Have you got a question or are you just yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if these are significantly different. No, that's a good question. An alternative for maybe less palatable um, proposal to that one? Going back to the, if you think back to the other uh, one you had on social mobility, that 0 0.43 correlation. That I was mentioning before. Mm -hmm. Is that not consistent with this if you think that indicates a kind of predestination effect? That no matter what happens in your life, in your young and middle years, in the end, the biggest determinant of where you're going to end up is your. But remember, these, there's no predestination here because these are all associations, as, as you keep telling us. Uh, yes. But there's a, a really interesting study that kind of does a wee bit of that. Again, it's a book I reviewed. It's, it's the Warsaw study, where they studied individuals of high levels of intelligence. It was written in a book, unfortunately, not published in the paper. They studied people of high levels of intelligence who did and didn't have education, and they found by middle age, the very top earners, it didn't matter how much education you had, the people rose to the top eventually. But I don't think you'd necessarily find that absolutely uh, everywhere. But the, this, and there's, there's anecdotal, I don't think there's enough long-term evidence to show this, there's anecdotal evidence that mental capability test scores might have a bigger effect on social position the later you measure a social position when you're getting away from initial restraints and, and credentials and that sort of thing. Yeah. But I don't think there's enough data to show. Yeah. So does this data kind of suggest that um, kind of environmental enrichment and kind of parental influence uh, or kind of environmental influence um, determines how intelligent the kid is to a greater extent up to the age of 16 yes. and so they're more likely to be able to kind of take advantage of any education they receive and then at the age of 16 they're able to do these kind of IT tests kind of regardless of what the enrichment is being Yes, I mean, I've been quite interested in that quite a few people have asked the same sort of thing about what's happening at any one state. But the whole thing about childhood sort of reeling is that you think it might have an effect on individual differences throughout life. And the surprise to me here is that it, it doesn't add variance. Yeah, but that's, that's only a, a making a difference to their intelligence. It's not making a difference to their, oh, fair enough. their attainment or okay. their, their life chances. So, I mean, where that graph might suggest that uh, environment isn't important to somebody's life chances, it's not important to their intelligence at age 16 and over. But um, that gap 
up to age 16 would suggest that um, it's important for him to have that high intelligence so that he can take advantage of the education and then can prosper from there. Okay. But we, we know that education, ha I mean, that, that's again something that the Scottish Mental Survey always said as well. High ability basically works in terms of getting you positioned through education if you get education, especially early on in the school. I want to say one more thing about this is that more recently, this is all done in twin studies, and you haven't asked a difficult question about twin studies as well in terms of how you separate out things like dominance and whether in fact the assumptions in it, like monozygotic twins are treated no more similarly than dizygotic, etc., are all under the carpet here. Sorry. However, we published a couple of things recently on, on some samples we've collected in the UK and Scotland and in England, where we've been using DNA testing to make estimates of, of heritability as well, and coming up with numbers slightly short of this, but we can now use uh, DNA testing. So the samples that we've got, we're testing them on over half a million individual bases, uh, DNA bases, and estimating heritability from that. So we're moving away now from having to need to use twin studies and adoptive studies to actually using tests of DNA. Could I, could I ask a question about the last slide? And I know you don't like to talk about mechanism, but is it a, bi is it a biological mechanism that explains the increase in uh, the black bars? <laughs> yes, I think so. And I will talk about mechanism there. We did we published a study in Nature in 2002 on our Lothian birth cohort of 1921. People who were born in 1921 and were tested at age 11. And then we gave them the same test again at age 80 almost, just over 79, we'll call it 80. You got the same test, you got about 500 people, maybe 485, we'll call it 500 people on the same test at age 11, at age 80. And we tested them at that time on a gene, a, well we tested whether they had different types of the gene. You heard of apolipoprotein E? Apo E, well, you should have. Uh, Apo E is the only, until recently, gene, the different flavours of which have an association with whether or not you're going to get late onset dementia. If you get the type called E4, you've got a slightly higher chance, slightly higher chance. And what we did was, we found in this sample, that the Lothian birth cohort, the Edinburgh group that we were studying, we found that the flavour that people had of the gene called APOE had no effect on intelligence at age 11, but had a significant effect at age 80. Now that's a nice twist, because genetics, not destiny, it's got an effect at age 80, but none at age 11. What might be the mechanism? Well, here's what we came up with. We looked into this gene, of course. It affects cholesterol transport, it affects neuronal repair. And what might be the case, and again, it's, it's better than speculation, but it is speculative, it might be the case that different types of this gene are more or less good at repairing your nerve cells throughout life. And basically, if you get the E4, it's like having a Friday afternoon mechanic. Whereas if you get the E3, it's like a better mechanic. Now, at age 11, it's quite possibly the case that there's not been much to repair. So there's probably no gene differences in intelligence. But you go forward to age 80, and you've had all this crap happening to you throughout life, probably your brains had to be serviced every so often, and if you're always getting this Friday afternoon mechanic, probably you're losing a little bit as you go on throughout life to get the idea. So that, that could be a mechanism. I think that's a beautiful example because it shows it's not destiny. Now, the other thing is, I've just reminded about the way to run away with that wee book I wrote over 10 years ago. The book you're reading at the weekend, those of you are coming to do it, I wrote over 10 years ago. However, I've just written uh, a review of what's been happening in intelligence in the last 10 years in the annual review of psychology. Now, it's behind the paywall, but if you actually email me, I will send you a copy for nothing, which I'm quite entitled to do for uh, academic purposes. So if you want, don't buy the book. Actually get something more up to date from me. It's, it's accessible. It's written in a fairly accessible way. It's about 30, 40 pages long as opposed to the 70 or whatever the book is. But uh, Jay, you're very welcome to email me. I will answer it uh, and send you a free copy of... of it's just called Intelligence. It's, it's what's been happening the last 10 years. Right, uh, another non-controversial thing. Bigger brains tend to be smarter. Uh, now, who's read Stephen Jay Gould's The Mismeasure of Man? Yeah. What did you think of it? Well, that's 20 years ago, so I realised that. But I read it well ago as well. It was 
Terrible. Oh, That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> and it's an odd thing, actually, because he wrote, and he made a full of this idea of, of the historical uh, sort of neurologists and psychologists tried to show an association between brain size and intelligence and tried to show how they were biased, etc., etc. But as, as people sent Gould the evidence that was coming out from MRI brain scanning, magnetic resonance imaging, brain scanning, which actually can measure the size of the brain and relate it to mental test scores, when he brought out the next version of his book, he simply didn't include that anymore, rather than actually saying, well, actually, there might, there might actually be an association. So what's the, what's the bottom line on this? Well, I'll give you one study, then I'll tell you what the meta-analysis shows of putting everything together. So here's a study we did, and at the time, this was about the biggest. About This is a guy that worked with me called Alistair McCulloch, who's now professor of geriatric medicine at the University of Edinburgh. As so he had this group of all healthy, older men, uh, who are about 100 of them, and he gave them this list of tests, doesn't matter, about eight tests, different things. He extracted this thing called general intelligence statistically from it, and he had magnetic resonance imaging brain scans of all of their brains. And in fact, oh, it's, a, it's a sort of Mills and Boone story. We had to hire in this study a research fellow. The research fellow was Karen Ferguson. She spent a year just measuring these 97 slices of brains. If you look at me for a minute, the slices go through that way, and you have to measure each slice to get the size, and then add all that up to get the, the volume of the brain. And actually, they ended up marrying each other. They've now got two children. <laughs> and, uh, I know, it's really nice. But anyway, Karen measured these areas of the brain, and we got an overall brain size, and we found that the correlation between these people's general intelligence and brain size was 0.42. Not big, but not we. And when people put together, Mike McDaniel did it first in 2005 in a journal called Intelligence. He put together, I think there's, in the world, there's about 3,000 subjects in total who've been brain scanned to get their brain size, who were not clinically unwell in any way, just healthy subjects. And he got a correlation of, I think it's 0.33. So it's slightly smaller than that, but within the confidence interval of that. We've just been studying our people in the Lothian birth court of 1936 at age 72, and we're about to publish a correlation that's probably going to be just above 0.3 in, in, in the biggest single sample. It's about, about 700 individuals. So, overall, there does seem to be a correlation that's modest, again, for the techies month so it probably explains somewhere upwards of 10% of the variance, but it's not huge. It's a crude measure anyway. But is there an association between having a bigger brain and being a higher scorer of these mental tests? The answer is yes. It's not a big effect, but there does seem to be an effect. Are there other aspects of the brain that relate to mental capability is the question that I hope you're going to ask me next. But I'm going to leave that on there. That's, people often ask, are bigger brains smarter? Yes, and it's still the case, well, there's also women's brains, different sizes from men, you could ask about as well if you wanted, and anyway, I'll, I'll throw it open at that point. Is this not getting into a dodgy area, because you've got all these studies of different okay, races and things like that? This is all in Caucasian uh, samples. But the, the interesting thing there is, brain size, far from being deterministic about mental capability differences, I'm going to talk about sex differences and intelligence, and I'm going to give it away now by saying there's no difference in general capability between men and women, but women have got smaller brains overall. But of course, of course if you control for height, you take quite a lot of the difference away as well. But this is just what, I'm just giving you, I mean, as, as we're often here, I'm just giving you what the literature says. <laughs> That's just what's in the literature. I'll take somebody who hasn't asked a question before. Uh, I see the Reagan metrics that they have such high correlation. Gene. Yeah. Uh, is that common just with this sample or in general? Because they are quite uh, culture free and they measure with the members of point of. Yeah, the chap's asking about Raven's matrices here, it's got the biggest association with Alistair's sample uh, here. And he's saying, I mean, the phrase culture free is just like a red rag to a bull, you know. <laughs> but Raven's matrices, as you're indicating, has got no words in it. It's got no numbers in it, and it's abstract shapes. And basically what happens is you get a series of these abstract shapes, and there's a little panel missing. And what you're asked to do is pick from a number of answer options, which is the one that completes the pattern. So it's a pattern completion test. And it was an attempt by John Raven 
a father of the current John Raven, who also works in the Raven's Majesty, try and implement Spearman's ideas about reasoning that's relatively pure without too much background of stuff that we you know. Yeah. Sorry, the question was whether the high correlation in G is just for this sample in general. No, you quite often find that. If you look at the snow, is it snow and Cronbach analysis as well, they put <coughs> Raven's vapesies in their circumplex quite near to the centre of G. In other words, if you've got a, a big battery of tests, Raven's tends to come out quite well in terms of a high G indicator. It's quite well known that different mental tests are better or worse at capturing this thing called G. Some have got low associated with G, some higher. Is there a correlation with uh, skull capacity or ventricle size? As you get older, uh, that, 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 that's an interesting question because, of course, as, as, as people get older, the ventricles and, and the sulci get bigger and there's more basic water inside the head than there is uh, at earlier ages as well. And so certainly in things like dementia, I mean, there's brain shrinkage that's, that's more than you would expect for, for age. But most of these, no, not including this sample, most of these are, are younger individuals, but that this age-related thing hasn't happened to anybody. No kind of indication that the brain hasn't actually kind of filled its kind of no. potential. No. No. The other thing I'm trying to nudge it says is brain size is a very crude indicator, and people do not know why brain size relates to intelligence. But with magnetic resonance imaging nowadays, you can do much better things than just measure the brain size. And to, be, to some extent, this is, this is actually not that interesting. <laughs> what people can now measure, everybody has heard of brain matter. Where is the green matter in the brain? Surface. It's near it's basically it's the, it's the surface of the cere cerebral cortex. But underlying that is what's called the white matter. And anybody not heard of the white matter? Yeah, okay, some people haven't. The white matter in the brain is the billions of connections between the bits of green matter. And it's a bit like a mental telephone exchange because it's got billions of connections and these connections are all insulated with a coating that includes myelin, which is fatty and looks white under the microscope. Therefore, it's called white matter. Now, magnetic resonance imaging scanning, things uh, like diffusion tensor imaging, like magnetic resonance transfer imaging, now can measure how good your white matter is and that's becoming a more popular thing to do that is measuring how good the connections are in your brain and to what extent they've stayed with good integrity as people grow older and that's a particular interest that we have in our big project called the Disconnected Mind which is why we're imaging <coughs> hundreds and hundreds of old people to see whether the mechanism of losing cognitive capability as you grow older is associated with losing the good connections because the one thing that we know about mental capability it's to do with joining all the bits of the brain up and thinking in concept. Joined up thinking is not just an overworn <laughs> cliche it's, a, it's a, an anatomical fact as well. And so this connectedness idea can actually be measured inside the head of my pretty pictures. I don't have to limit myself to what I mean. But I showed this just to say, let's get this old chestnut out of the way. There is an association with brain size. It's not that interesting because there are lots of other more mechanistic things we can do with brain. So for example, the study that came out of McGill University in Canada a couple of years ago that looked at cortical thickness in children as they grew up from young to adolescence and showed that high ability children have got different trajectories of change in cortical thickness as they grow up. It's not just that it's thick, it's that their trajectory is different from, from children with different capabilities. So people are now digging into the brain metaphorically, as you can now do by looking inside the brain with things, well, typically magnetic resonance brain imaging, which is nice because it doesn't involve any radioactivity, unlike some other types of brain imaging. The reason I showed you this was really to get it out of the way. There is an association, but it hasn't led anywhere mechanistically. There are lots of other areas that, that, that now are, that are far more interesting. I better watch this screen. Uh, right, I've given this on the way. Uh, do you remember that hierarchical pattern I showed earlier with G at the top and the, and the, the things below? Well, this isn't my research. We've done some stuff on G. We took the Scottish Mental Survey of 1932, because it's the... You see, when you study, try and study sex differences 
there's always a worry that whatever sample you have could be biased. You get that idea. If, even if you've got thousands and thousands, they could somehow be selected along cognitive lines to make either the males or the females slightly higher or slightly lower. The nice thing about the Scottish Mental Surveys is it was the entire population. There was no selection. Of course, not every did it. The occasional person was all sick that day or whatever. But we had 40,000 boys and 40,000 girls who took the Murray House test, and we published on that showing even with 40,000 boys and 40,000 girls, there was no significant difference in general mental ability. Now, with 40,000, we could have detected a minute difference, and there was nothing significant between them. However, however, we did find a difference, and it's not an easy one to describe, and I invented this thing called a mirror plot to try and explain it. And here it is. Right, this is the Scottish Mental Survey of 1932. And can you all see the dots? If you add up all these dots and all these dots, this is girls and this is boys. In total, there are these 80 odd thousand children. And what I did was, I took the IQ score, I converted these into IQ scores, which by definition have got a mean of 100. And I stuck them into bins of five. So this one's 60 up to 65, this is 65 up to 70, this is 70, you get the idea. This one here, I think, is 95 up to 100. And what I did was, I said, in the population, at any level of IQ, what's the proportion of boys and girls that you find? And this is the way I, I showed it. So let's just take, just around 100. So if we take IQ around 100, can you all see that here... There's about 48% boys, about 51, 52% girls. So around the average scores, there are slightly more girls than boys. So this entire population sample, the girls are better at being average. There are more of them, okay? And if you look down at the bottom, can you all see that as you get lower and lower, there's a bigger proportion of boys? These are the distributions in the bins, not the distribution of IQ. This is, this is actually just the sheer numbers. Yeah. So here I'm just saying, for that bin, what's the proportion of boys and girls for that IQ? Between 60 and 65, what's the proportion of boys and girls? Mm -hmm. And as you get to the average, it goes down so that there are, more, uh, more boy, uh, so that there are fewer boys. But the boys are better at being low scorers. <laughs> Which is quite well known among people who study mild mental uh, sort of handicap. It used to be called learning difficulties. Now, I remember one of my daughters, who's a bit of a firebrand, uh, who saw this, and long before I described it, said, Dad, you must not publish this. I like this hard enough already. <laughs> and you all have to realise as well, there's far more per dot here than there are at these extremes. But there are more boys at this site as well. So for whatever reason, and this is why I said at the beginning, this is just mental test scores. But we've replicated this in the cognitive ability tests in England using over 100,000. The people who developed the cognitive ability test in the States have done it on their massive samples. I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands here. And they found exactly the same pattern as well. If you make that not general ability, and if you take it to verbal ability, the boys never show this advantage. You get the bottom end for the boys, but the girls always stay better. If you see what I mean. But for general mental ability, we've found we and others have found this pattern. Now, also, it's not the case. We've written a long paper on this in Perspectives in Psychological Science with Wendy Johnson as the first author on that. We've also argued that the same reasons need not explain this and this, the two ends of the extreme. So, there seem to be no mean differences, there's no average difference in intelligence, in general intelligence, but there's this slightly weird pattern whereby there's a slight, there's a slight tendency for boys to be better at scoring lower and scoring at the top end as well. Any questions? Does that persist throughout life? There are almost no samples that go on to adults. Mm -hmm. and the problem I have, there's been quite a lot of debate recently, in fact there's quite a big debate in nature uh, with people taking quite severe different stances and 
I basically think once you get into the later school years, there's so much selection along educational lines. Until you've got an entire population, it's just extremely hard to test. And the other thing that we showed as well, is this going to be too complicated? <laughs> we showed this. We took one of the British cohort studies, and we took the IQ from age 10, pretty much the same age as this, because there are other cohort studies. And what we said was, was there any difference in boys and girls at age 10? And, and let's just say no. Okay? Then we said, what would happen if we took those age 10 scores but only had the people who came back later in life at 30 and later on? What we found was this, was that because in longitudinal studies it tends to be the cleverer people who come back, okay, you can manufacture an apparent mean advantage for boys later in these population samples because if there is an effect of lower ability people not coming back, so if you're wiping out some of that, you're getting more of that, and so the people left, you're missing out the low end of the boys and only getting the advantage, you get the idea. So we were the first to show that the apparent mean advantage for adult males might actually be an artifact of selection. It's quite complicated. And then a guy called Errol Hunt came along, an old psychiatrician, did a beautiful mathematical model of it and showed that it's probably right. So it's really complicated. And until you've got an entire population, of course you can't just say people have to do these tests, except in Sweden. Actually one of our Swedish subjects is here uh, this evening who took the Swedish conscription test earlier. The only person I've ever met who told me about it. Uh, <laughs> my, I don't remember it, maybe about it. But, uh, so until you get an entire population, you can be really led up the garden path by selection problems. And I would say most of the studies of sex differences in mental capability suffer from bias, some sort of selection problems in their, in their samples. And I don't trust them. I trust the, uh, the Scottish Medical Service because they're complete complete uh, populations, they're not samples. Do you think there's an evolutionary um, reason why uh, <laughs> men can be stupid <laughs> and get away with it and, and reproduce? Um, whereas maybe to be a woman you need to... We wrote a, we wrote a paper trying to, to look at, in fact, whether the X chromosome might have an effect. Because if you think of what's happening on the X and Y chromosome, Women have got two X chromosomes, so any deleterious thing on one is counteracted by probably a more common allele on the other uh, chromosome. But men have only got one, and so there could be uncounteracted un effects on, on the X chromosome. We do, again, we've got this suggestion looking as whether that was feasible, that could explain some of this as well. So that could be part of the, the mechanism there as well. The other A. Uh, no, yeah, that'll be just <laughs> right. Uh, the thing I actually work on is cognitive aging. Almost all my research is a team who works on mental capability, and it's very easy to get into this idea of you know that when you get older, there are lots of functions, including mental ones, that aren't the same as when, on average, as when you were young. So, for example, simple things: your grip strength isn't the same as when you were young. Your walking speed's not the same as when you were young. You can't blow as hard and fast out of your lungs as when you were young. Your bladder uh, capability is not the same as when you were young. And your fluid type intelligence is probably not the same as when you were young. However, it doesn't all go when it goes. And there are oodles of different things. I'm going to show the Seattle uh, study here. And unfortunately these are cross-sectional data, but it's just a nice diagram. There are six lines here, and I'm just hoping that it's obvious to everybody that four of those lines are plummeting, and two of them are staying pretty flat. So the ones that are plummeting are up here. This is age 25. This is age 81. And these are four <laughs> mental capabilities. Can you see they're going down from the 20s to the 30s, maybe a bit later, down. And they are inductive reasoning, working things out from first principles. Spatial orientation, seeing things in two and three dimensions and working out what's happening. Perceptual speed, picking up fine details of what's happening in the environment as quickly as you can. And verbal memory, remembering things you've been told. 
However, two things, numerical ability and verbal ability, are here. They pick up towards middle age and they're still quite good in old age as well. So, there are some mental skills that are much less age sensitive than others on average and these are generally called crystallised mental abilities. So much so, let's just take the verbal abilities. Has anybody heard of a test called the National Adult Reading Test? That's what some of you have. It's a remarkable test. It takes about three to five minutes to do on, on a good day. And all it involves doing is reading aloud 50 words. And these words are all irregular in their stress and or their grapheme phoneme associations. They don't sound like what they should in normal English. So if you've never seen them before, you would typically guess the wrong pronunciation. Now this test of just pronouncing 50 irregular words correlates scarily high with a test that can take a couple of hours like the Wexler Adult Intelligence Scale. And it's sometimes used as, and wait for it, an estimate of what is called pre-morbid or prior intelligence. Because so much does a capability like that, on the one hand, not decrease with age, and so much does it correlate with other mental capabilities in younger people, it's thought to, even in old age, get back to how bright you used to be as an estimate. We actually looked at this in the people born in 1921. We looked at people at about age 80, and we had their national adult reading test score. But we also had their IQ age 11. And we looked at the national adult reading test in people with early dementia born in 1921, and we found out their IQs from age 11. And it did just as well, almost, in people with early dementia as in older people. And it correlated just as well with the same test given in later life as well. So it was quite a good estimate. So, it, so my point here is intelligence, especially when you're talking about ageing, is not just one thing. And this characteristic of fluid versus crystallised invented by Raymond Cattell and John Horne in the 1960s is a highly workable and useful and valid, I think, distinction between different types of mental capabilities. But of course, no test is completely fluid, involving nothing that you're bringing to the table, and no test is completely crystallised such that you can't work out something from it. Uh, so, for example, I'm just trying to think. Vocabulary is often thought to be crystallised. You know it or you don't. It doesn't hurt your head to work it out. You just know it you don't know what you do. However, I remember this. I should actually tell you this. It's, a, it's an item in a published test which is still copyrighted. Okay. In one vocabulary test, which you might never come across, there's <laughs> uh, a word, okay, and you're given six alternatives to what that might mean. And you might never have heard of this word, you only find it in posh papers like The Guardian and things like that. And, uh, I remember seeing that for the first time and thought, if I go back to my Latin penumbra, it's probably got something to do. And it did. And I could actually work out. See what I mean? So I, I made my heart, head hurt. So it wasn't just knowing it or not knowing it. I didn't know the word, but I could actually work it out from, from, from knowing something else. So that you could say maybe loan a, loan a bit of Latin as crystallised well. Yeah. Thanks for your question. This thing with monitors, people are monitored to be for pleasure. And like the common post words don't know your problem. You have condition is for the problem here. That would make, and it might stay in the back of the head. So you might, when you Remember, this would happen to be in, a, in the garden, whether and with that, you wouldn't come back to the okay. If you mean, I, sorry, I didn't pick up all of that, but if you mean that the, the, the intelligence which is proactive, and once you, you've got this situation, you would go and find out more about it yeah, in the first place. Mean, like, um, in the one case, when people are more likely to be for pleasure, and so they're more likely to come up with all these news awards. Well, certainly the big, sorry. And then so we let's do better in the verbability test. They do do. I mean, it's quite a the cavity is quite a strong indicator. Yeah, but, um, you know, like the, cause, it's not because it when tells it because he reads more. This is pushing up the verbability. Yes, but remember what I said earlier as well. I mean, you, you're saying that at the same time, the vocabulary tests are very strongly loaded on this thing called G. And that's also how we loaded on things that have nothing to do with reading as well. So you can't, you can't just invoke. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between crystallised intelligence and rote memory? 
Well, crystallized intelligence means knowing about singularities in the world. It means knowing that knowing something that a particular word is sounded in a particular way. And it's not just things it's not just rote because what you happen to find out and Jim Flynn's good on this one, the guy who invented the Flynn effect. He often gives the example, he always gives the example of baseball. And he's, to some extent, somebody who could be characterised in some ways as, as not all that keen on mental ability testing. However, he does say this. What characterises somebody's intelligence is, given no compulsion to learn things by rote, they just suck up things about the world and seem to take in more, so that by the end of the day they do happen to know, you know who's in the archers and what different types of wine, do you know what I mean? Things that are not necessarily interesting. He used the example of baseball, and he, he was always struck by really intelligent people with no interest in it, but knew all, the, uh, knew all the rules and all the rest of it as well. So it's something about the world that just hoovers things up, and as it's rote would imply, you know, sitting down to learn it. But intelligence is often a thing about just get, catching on to things in, in, in life and picking up more. So it always surprises me. I mean, the bright people know all this stuff, but not necessarily interested in it as well. So more questions. Okay, we better get on, haven't we? What have we got to do? Right. Okay. And this is from my own uh, research. Is that the thing that interests me is that not everybody. H. See, this is a lie, basically, because a it's cross sectional, and b it's the average. And what I what I'm interested in is how people actually buck the trend. And so this is one of my favourite graphs, it's, it's replicated quite a lot. This is our Lothian birth cohort of 1921, some of you might have seen this already. This is about 480 odd people, and it's their IQ scores from age 11, and then up to age almost 80. And so each dot is a person, and it represents, and let's just take that person in the middle here. And at age 11, their IQ was just, can you see it's just about average? And at age 80, it's about average as well. And this person here has got a high score at age 11, and a high score at age 80. And oh, that's moved actually. This here has got a low score, and a low score. And this person here, I'm really interested in because they haven't got dementia, but they've got a high score in childhood, but a lower score in adulthood. And this one's meant to be over here. This person has got a, a fairly mediocre score in childhood, but a much better score in adulthood. Now, some of this is error of measurement, obviously, but some of it is also regularity, like what I was talking about with the Apple E gene either. So I'm interested in the research and the fact that we don't all age according to the mean and that people differ. And so if, in fact, everybody held the same mental test score from age 11 to age 80, all these dots would fall on a single line. And the fact that some people are up here means they're doing better than you would expect given their childhood scores. And the fact that some people down here means they're doing worse in old days than you, than you would expect. And my research program is basically about finding the things that are pushing us up and holding up our mental capability beyond what you would expect from our peers in, in old age and also finding out what, what, what leads us down. So what are some of these effects? Well, some of the effects are things like not smoking, uh, have, being physically fit, picking the right genes to have in old age, uh, having more education, higher social class, those, those sorts of things. So it's, it's a range of things from social to genetic. So not everybody ages in the same way, so that the actual mean is it's not a lie, but it's a summary that doesn't apply to us all in the room. Not everybody is going to be average. Maybe I'll, I'll, okay, I'll take a quick question. Would you not have expected to see dots slightly higher up than that, or is that just sort of a middle of the graph? That's a correlation of about 0.6 to 0.7, and that, that's what it is. I mean, that, these are just descriptive uh, data. What I do want to point out, though, is this is typical of longitudinal studies. We've got representation here, but it's a bit emptier than up there. And that's because the lower ability people for children don't tend to come back so, so much in old age. Of course, part, they've died off in, in greater numbers as well. Of course, I saw a question there. We haven't had a question from you before. Yeah, I was just curious. Coming away from aging, looking at how people's IQ might change, has anyone ever studied how things like illness and disability and accidents could affect these things? These are... We try and get on top of that because we do have, and, and not just us, but other uh, longitudinal studies do ask about things like those. 
like medical uh, things, we always know what medications people are on. We ask if they've got hypertension, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. It all sounds very straightforward and medical. They are hellish to quantify yeah. uh, these sorts of things. They're really very difficult. I spent a long time working in diabetes and trying to estimate whether things like hypoglycemic attacks affecting people's mental capability. And that sounds like a nice, clear thing to measure. But you try and measure the thump on the head that effectively over a lifetime people with diabetes have got with regard to severe hypoglycemia. These things are, are hard to measure. But yes, we do try and measure them, but they're, they're not the easiest thing to actually quantify. Because what you're actually trying to get is not whether somebody's had cardiovascular disease, but the actual thump on the head that's resulted in it. So in fact, I was just trying to think of an interesting. Yeah, we got involved in one study that was looking at cardiovascular, eh, cardiopulmonary bypass surgery. And that's quite well known, especially in the early days, had an effect on mental capability. And we didn't know why. I mean, people were trying to estimate, was it to do with things flying off up, up into the brain? Or because during the procedure you didn't get enough oxygen into the brain? It's just very hard to measure what was the thump on the brain, even with something specific like that. So actually going over a lifespan and actually asking somebody, you know, how much have you actually uh, damaged your brain? Uh, damaged in inverted commas, I don't mean... Uh, clinically damaged, but just all the little things that you've done to it, quite hard to quantify. That's what There's we need. There's going to be lots of outliers for different We need, we need to try and do that. Yeah, but also, I mean, some of this is just going to be stochastic, by which I mean it's going to be lots of little individual idiosyncratic effects that we're never actually going to be able to measure. And it's always going to look as if it's in the error variance of these things. It's a kind of a, it's not a council of despair, but you've got to admit that you can't measure everything in, in, in life. I'm going to better move on to my last one. I'm sorry, I know all these people. But this is, we did not bad timing wise. It's about 5 2 now. Right. Has, has anyone not heard of the Flynn effect? Yeah, okay. Right, the Flynn effect. That's New Zealand political psychologist Jim Flynn. Uh, Jim cottoned on to this idea that every so often, Cognitive ability tests need to be renormed because people are doing too well on them. <laughs> and so over time, they get renormed. So he got, thought it was quite curious, and so he set about, and he's a real sort of tiger, and he found databases from all over the world. And here's just one example of a Flynn effect. And it's not Jim Flynn's work, it's actually. The uh, Seattle Longitudinal Study we analysed by Tim Salthouse. But this, let me just show you, this line is for the age 20, people aged 25. So every dot here is people aged 25. This is age 46. This is age 67. And this is the year of the test. So uh, what I want you to see is, if you were 25 in 1956, this is how well you scored. But if you were 25 in 1991, that's how well you scored. But if you, were 20, if you were 46 in 1956, that's where you scored. If you were 46 in 1991, that's how well you scored. If you were 67 in 1956, that's how well you scored. And if you were 50, uh, 67 in 1991, that's how well you scored. That's the Flynn effect, basically. So over time, there seems to have been what is called the rising IQ. Now Flynn's very careful to say this, although he's found this effect, Within any cohort born at a particular time, he says it doesn't affect the predictive validity, like associated with education. It doesn't affect the heritability, which he accepts. He just thinks that's a curious thing. And when the Flynn effect was shown, people went two different directions. Flynn goes a slightly complicated third one, but I'm going to count two. The two, one was the idea was that this wasn't really a rising intelligence. This was test familiarity. So over time, IQ type items appear on cereal packets and in the early learning centre toys and people just kind of get used to these things a bit more. And other folks are saying, well, actually, height's gone up. And that's probably because you've got better nutrition, etc. Probably it is a reason to rise. I, I just put my cards on the table and think it can't all be a rise in intelligence because you have to then accept that you know, a few generations back, people would on average be mentally handicapped. Okay, it would be that might that be that big an effect. It doesn't seem plausible. I mean, they were reading Victorian novels. <laughs> <laughs> and they were selling quite well. So that's the that's the Jim Flynn effect, and he's actually got a he's actually got an effect all to him, 
all to himself, this political philosopher. And it's still a conundrum. Jim thinks, briefly, he wrote a very long, complicated article with Bill Dickens, who's a, 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 an econometrician. And they think it's a multiplier effect whereby very small initial differences that might be genetic get multiplied in the environment, such that if you're just very, very slightly better with ball skills or just slightly taller, you're the one that gets all the training in the team, and you're the one that goes and plays at the weekends, and then you start playing during the week as well, and of course everything then multiplies. He also thinks that the rise has been probably something called abstract reasoning, that we value now much more than ever used to be valued, and this isn't the same as intelligence, because although he's in some ways highly critical of intelligence research, he's not against the idea as well, so he's a highly nuanced. But anyway, the fun effect you should know about, because it is out there, and these scores have been rising over time. So, and Flynn's very keen on this as well, because he's a great, in his political philosophy, he's very keen on social justice. And he has said, think of the implications in the US if these scores can be used to determine whether or not you're going to be subject to capital punishment. And that could change over time based on mental test score that isn't staying steady as well. And I think it's a very, very good point in terms of social justice point as well. So it's almost 10 o'clock. I want to tell you about 10 reasonably interesting things about intelligence, and those were the. <laughs>